and so you're stuck with me. So welcome, and thank you for a 3.30 SSB committee. And so first thing, uh, request for bill introductions. Anybody have a bill? Very good. Seeing none, the next is Secretary Laura Howard for, are you, that's what it says here. Is that correct? Okay, very good. <laughs> um, you look surprised, and you look surprised, and so I thought. Is there? No. Anyway. Okay. You want me to go first? All right. Very good. All right, very good. Thank All you. All right. Thank very you for good. Being here. Thank you. Um, so, Laura Howard here today with my um, hat on as Secretary of KDADS. You got to hear me yesterday from DCF. So, today, um, I think it's one of your last overview presentations. We're going to talk about um, home and community based service waivers and what those animals are under Medicaid and what that means here in Kansas. So, um, this is a bit of an HCBS Waiver 101 presentation. And we'll start with some general things just about um, really just trying to set the stage and kind of ground people in what we mean when we say waivers. Um, and then later in the testimony, we'll move into the specific waivers that Kansas has and the, the people within Kansas who are served by each of those. Um, so what is a waiver? Um, you know, within the, the Medicaid program, um, States operate um, under the context of state plans that are approved by the Federal Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services under the guise of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, what a waiver does, um, when, we, when we make a request for a waiver and we submit waiver requests, um, is it allows some exceptions from what might normally take place in Medicaid. Um, we're here today to talk specifically about home and community-based services waivers, and there's some other types of waivers, and I'll mention a couple of those later in the presentation. But a home and community-based service waiver, you'll hear HCBS um, all the time in talking about these services, is an authorization from Medicaid that lets beneficiaries get services at home or in the community rather than having to enter an institution to get those services. So it's really just what it says. It's a waiver to allow people to receive home or community-based services instead of having to go into an institutional setting, for example, a nursing facility. The, the program federally was initiated in the 1980s, um, and individual states apply for and administer their own waiver programs um, with authority given um, to us from the Federal Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to do that. You know, historically, you know, as, as I was alluding to earlier, um, Medicaid only provided funding um, for those institutional-based settings, whether that was a nursing home, whether that was a, um, what we might call an intermediate care facility for people with developmental disabilities, like one of our state hospitals, K&I or Parsons, um, and people eligible for Medicaid who needed skilled nursing kinds of services or services to help them with activities of daily living, um, like dressing, um, those sorts of things, had to enter institutions in order to access Medicaid benefits. So that's kind of the, the groundwork for it. And so again, an HCBS waiver then allows the state to um, utilize um, federal Medicaid matching dollars for those services and supports in people's homes and communities. You know, there's a lot of um, factors that go into place when states request these waivers. Um, but on page three, just some general things that are true across the board for home and community-based services waivers. Um, we have to be able to demonstrate that providing services under the waiver won't cost any more than it would have cost for providing it in the institution. So, for example, if we take um, our frail elderly waiver where we're serving um, um, some of our seniors, um, in the community, we have to prove that those services don't cost more than it would cost to serve them in a nursing home. We also, um, beyond the cost issue, we also have to, there's a lot of provisions um, when we apply for waivers um, where we have to ensure the protection of people's health and welfare, that they'll be safe receiving those services in that home and community-based setting, and that we have those safeguards in place. 
There's also requirements around um, provider standards, um, that there's adequate providers, um, and that, that we have adequate and reasonable standards to meet the needs of the population of each waiver. And then also, the services have to follow an individualized and person-centered service plan. So again, those are kind of general criteria that apply to any home and community-based services waiver. Um, and those are some of the things that we have to demonstrate um, when we apply for a waiver or, or when we renew existing waiver authority from the Federal Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, just a little bit more background on page four, um, just again, just speaking speaking broadly. Now, as I said, um, these are agreements, essentially, that we enter into with our federal partner. Um, you have to submit very extensive applications, waiver applications, to the federal agency. They describe everything from how are you going to assess the individual to see whether they qualify for the waiver, what services they need, what level of care they need, what services is the waiver going to pay for, and in a very, very specific way. Um, you know, what are those specific services? How long can someone get those services? What might be the, the scope? of those services, and then again, how um, under the waiver we would be ensuring the health and welfare of the recipients. Um, there's a lot of um, things to do with quality and program evaluation, and then appeal rights for the individuals who are receiving those services. Um, on page five, um, I just included this slide. I think it's a slide that um, Director Fertig, the Medicaid director, used recently at the Bethel Committee because I think it gives a, a good overview just generally of kind of that concept of waivers. Um, you know, as I, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, um, the main agreement between um, a state and the federal government for running the Medicaid program is the, is the state plan that each state has um, with CMS. And that ensures, you know, we'll follow the federal rules and there's a lot of those um, in order to receive the federal federal share of the money, and we'll ensure that people are going to receive the benefits that are included um, within our state plan, both mandatory benefits the federal government requires and any optional benefits we might have in our state plan. So, so once you go beyond the state plan, when you want to do something different or beyond, you seek that waiver authority. And you're really seeking, you know, authority to waive certain provisions of federal Medicaid law. As I said earlier, with how many based services, we're waiving um, um, you know, those provisions that would mean those services have to be in an institution. Um, with other kinds of waivers, um, like the 1115 waiver, um, those can be used for kind of experimental pilot demonstration projects. Um, CanCare right now has been operating for the last few years under an 1115 waiver. Um, and then 1915B waivers are waivers um, also that can be are often used in the world of managed care that allow you to waive things like freedom of choice for recipients to assign them to a managed care plan. So again, lots and lots of authorities under Medicaid. We're really focused today on the um, 1915C waiver, which is the on the, the right bottom corner of page five, which is the waiver that allows states to essentially change those federal Medicaid rules to allow those dollars to be spent for home or community-based services rather than in an institution. All right, getting um, more into Kansas, um, because again, you can look across the country. Um, States have made um, different choices to use um, this home and community-based services waiver authority. In Kansas, um, we currently operate seven home and community-based service waivers. Um, I've listed, just listed those on page six. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail about each of those. Um, but just from their very scope, um, these waivers um, touch everyone from our youngest citizens, for example, the autism waiver that serves those zero to five, all the way up to our senior citizens through the Fair Elderly Waiver um, and, and some things in between. So again, seven waivers in Kansas. Um, we really were um, one of the early adopter states in terms of waivers, particularly the IDD waiver, the Fair Elderly, and the Physical Disability Waivers um, have, been, have been around for quite a long time in Kansas. Um, on page seven, um, just a quick snapshot of the waiver enrollments um, as of um, December 2022. 
You can see that the smallest waiver um, is the autism waiver with 53 people receiving services. Um, the largest is the IDD waiver with over 9,000 receiving services. Um, altogether, um, just under 27,000 Kansans rely on these home and community-based services to receive supports in their home or community and, and really to um, be able to um, remain at home, not be in an institution and live their life in the community. Um, we also um, have wait, waiting lists on two of those. Um, you know, home and community-based service programs are not um, entitlement programs like the basic parts of Medicaid are. Um, so states are allowed to have waiting lists for those um, programs, whereas um, just generally under Medicaid, if someone enrolls and they qualify, um, you know, you can't say, well, we're going to shut the door tomorrow and just start a waiting list for basic Medicaid benefits. But you are allowed to do that um, for home and community-based service waivers. Those are not considered to be a a federal entitlement. Um, so again, um, we'll talk a little more about those waiting lists as we go through the presentation, but just a quick snapshot um, uh, just of those total numbers. On page eight, um, still kind of staying a little bit in the aggregate, um, I wanted to give you at least for our four largest waivers, um, the developmental disability waiver for elderly, physical disability, and brain injury, um, a little bit of history in terms of the caseloads for those waivers. Um, we've gone back to state fiscal year 2016. Um, you can see, for example, the um, IDD waiver. Um, the started in that period of time at about 8801. We're currently at about 9,030. Um, you can see the frail elderly waiver um, has had, that's the orange on the chart. It's had a little bit of ups and downs, um, but it's interesting with the frail elderly waiver to look at the last um, two to three years um, and to begin to see that um, waiver begin to grow. Um, it had fallen for a little while. Um, um, and it's begun to grow again. Um, and, and it's kind of in concert with the pandemic. I think what we don't know yet is what choices people will make on an ongoing basis. Will we see more of a trend of people choosing, um, electing to um, go on the frail elderly waiver, stay in a community-based setting, rather than perhaps go into a nursing facility? So those numbers are a little bit on the upswing on the frail elderly side. Um, physical disability again, um, not very much change over that time period. Um, and, and in fact, the, the couple years where you did see um, speci specific increases were when the um, legislature approved specific funding to reduce the waiting list. And then brain injury, I'll talk more about this in a little bit, um, the yellow bar at the very bottom of the chart. You'll see the numbers specifically begin to rise in a significant way starting in state fiscal year 21. That has to do with the implementation of policy changes that came from the legislature that expanded that waiver from just serving traumatic brain injuries like you might get from a motorcycle accident to serving acquired brain injuries like from a stroke and also serving children. So you could really see the numbers on that waiver um, begin to grow so that it's a about twice as many people on that waiver as there were in 2016. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that and some unique characteristics of that waiver. Um, last, maybe aggregate slide, and I wanted to give you a picture of um, how many people are on the waiver, what the growth has been, and then just the overall spending. Um, you've got a slide on page nine. So as we um, look across the um, waiver programs, you can see for each of um, those waivers on this chart, you know, what the growth has been um, in those waivers. Um, so again, um, if you, for example, look in um, fiscal year 23, you'll see pretty significant growth on the developmental disability waiver. Um, that's really due to actions by this legislature to put significant resources into that waiver to provide 25% increase in rates on that waiver last year and some other adjustments as, as well. Um, so again, um, it gives you a, a bit of a trend. Um, altogether, when you add all these up though, um, the waivers amount to more than a billion dollars um, in the KDES budget, in the state's budget. So it's just just over a billion dollars across the waivers. 
All right, and that's kind of the oh, an overview piece before I get into the individual waivers. So I'm um, starting on page 10. Um, I'll, you know, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on each waiver, but just give you a bit of a picture of who the waiver serves, what kind of services it provides, um, and if there are maybe some unique things that it's important to talk about. Um, you know, the autism waiver was established in 2007. It provides support and training to parents of children age zero to five who have an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis um, to help ensure that those uh, kiddos can remain in their family home. There's three specific services around the waiver, respite care, family adjustment counseling, and parent support and training. Um, it is important to note with the autism waiver that there's a number of services that are provided under the Medicaid state plan. So, you know, people who are on, who are eligible for Medicaid and on the waiver also, of course, qualify for all of the other benefits of Medicaid, whether that's physician or hospitals or pharmacies, all of the other services. But a number of autism services are within the Medicaid state plan itself. Um, some of the individual, intensive individual supports, um, some of the ABA therapies. So the autism waiver, I mean, it is valuable, but as more of those services have been provided under the state plan, and we, and we were actually directed by um, CMS to make um, the um, applied behavioral analysis services available to all Medicaid beneficiaries back in 2017. Um, the waiver really provides less of the supports than, than I think this than the state plan does. And that's why I think those of you on the interim committee perhaps heard us talk a bit about um, in the context of thinking about a new committee supports waiver, we might think about where autism fits into that mechanism and how we might think about um, what this waiver needs to cover um, or not. And again, it's a small number of, of recipients today. Um, on page 11, we got into this a little bit in the overview. We don't use the same kind of a waiting list on the autism waiver because we don't um, assess um, those children um, at the front end. So we have um, probably a, a poorer estimate in what we call a proposed recipient list um, as individuals who have some interest in receiving services. Again, in many cases, those um, families may already be receiving services through the Medicaid state plan. Um, so again, the autism waiver is our smallest waiver, serves our youngest kiddos. Um, the second one I was going to talk about is the frail elderly waiver. Um, going maybe from our youngest kiddos to our seniors. Um, the Fair Elderly Waiver is one of our um, older waivers, starting in 1997. It provides Kansas seniors an alternative to nursing home care. About 6,800 seniors um, receive these services today. And when you think about the kinds of services, you know, personal care services, that might be assistance with dressing, assistance with bathing, those, those activities that we all take for granted in our daily living, what we call ADLs. Um, under the waiver, people can also get assistance with certain household tasks, um, as well, of course, um, certain health and medical services. Um, to be eligible for the FE waiver, you've got to be 65 or older. You have to meet Medicaid financial criteria, and you have to meet the Medicaid long-term care threshold. That means you have to qualify for nursing facility level of care, that institutional equivalent I talked about, that the waiver allows you to serve those individuals who might otherwise be in a nursing facility in the community. Um, we don't have a wait list for those services right now, and we've not had to request um, additional resources um, in this year's budget. But as I did show you on that chart, it has started to grow. So if, as that growth continues, um, um, I won't, wouldn't be at all surprised if a year from now when we submit a budget, if we need to request some additional resources to manage that growth um, or to impose a waiting list. Um, so the frail elderly waiver, though, when in contrast, say, to the developmental disability waiver, you know, it has quite a bit of churn. So you can bring people on during the year because by its nature, it's serving people who are older. So you're going to have more people who may pass away. You may have some individuals who do end up going to um, a nursing facility um, or another setting. So even in the context of the same level of resources, you have some movement on that waiver. And that's that's really what's, what's different when we 
get to particularly the IDD waiver and why the waiting list on the IDD waiver is, is such a challenge for all of us. Um, so again, quick overview of the Farrell and Elderly waiver, about 6,800 seniors. Um, the next waiver and the largest of our waivers um, is the um, IDD waiver. Started in 1991. And again, it delivers community-based services to individuals who are five and older, who have a developmental disability, meet the definition of an intellectual disability, and who would otherwise qualify for care in what we call an intermediate care facility for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, examples of an ICF would be our state hospitals, k and and Parsons. Um, we also have a very small number of private ICF facilities as well. Um, you can see, um, again, that criteria called out on, on page 13 um, of the document. Um, and so when we think about um, this waiver, um, there's a single point of entry to the HCBS IDD waiver. This is actually called out in state law under the Federal Disability um, Re De Developmental Disability Reform Act. Um, your local community developmental disability organization um, is the entity that determines the functional eligibility for that waiver and who works with the individual and their family to access services from a variety of community service providers in the area. So again, each of you has a CDDO in your area, whether that's Cottonwood and Lawrence, Tark and Topeka, Big Lakes, I mean, whoever your CDDO is um, that your counties have determined to be your CDDO are the entry point for the waiver. Um, again, in terms of services offered, um, similarly, this personal care assistance, bathing, toileting, laundry, light, housekeeping, health-related care. Um, also with this waiver, there are day programs, um, maybe medical alert device, um, services, um, financial management services, supportive employment services. Um, and on this waiver, this means that individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities are living in the community as independently as possible. In some cases, um, they're living in a single residence or apartment by themselves. In many instances, they're living in a group home. Um, so as you think about your own communities, you may be familiar with some of those community providers that provide those services to the individual. So we're really providing um, under these waivers kind of it's pretty 24-7 services in terms of day type services, supported employment services if they're working, and then that, um, you know, the overnight services, what we think of as day and residential services. And that's what makes this such a robust waiver and also our most expensive waiver, I mean, in terms of the cost per person. Um, I wanted to give you just a sense of the, the waiting list. I, I, I kind of grimace when I, every time I look at this chart on page 15, um, the red line kind of shows um, the history of the wait list on the IDD waiver. And you, you can see um, just really kind of a continued line um, going up for many, many years. This isn't a new issue, um, the waiting list, but certainly as the waiting list has gone up, the time that people are waiting to get services has extended significantly. You know, the green line on this is, is kind of an interesting um, thing to, to mention. Um, Many years ago, and until about 2013, we kept two waiting lists on the IDD waiver. Um, we kept a waiting list for people who were not receiving any services. And then there were some individuals that, we, that were receiving some services. Maybe they were receiving some day services. Maybe they were receiving some services in their family home. Um, but maybe they were waiting to get residential services. Um, so we had what we called an underserved wait list and an unserved wait list. Um, CMS came into the state um, and said, you really can't do that. Um, if a person comes on, you can't limit the services that people are eligible to get on that waiver. And that's kind of when it shifted to, you know, a little bit of an all or none waiver. I see you um, nodding your head, Representative Carpenter. I, I do think that you can, you can see a little bit of the line, the growth of that line changing a little bit at that time as well. So um, again, and it also speaks 
speaks to when you talk about the community support services waiver later today. Um, maybe the, the benefits of having multiple options for this population. So on the, so, so as you think about the IDD um, wait list, um, about 4,800 people, um, we're serving you know, just over 9,000 people. We've got um, that number of individuals on the wait list. Um, we started offering um, 60 more people services in January. I mean, really what we could afford within the, within the budget that was available based on the churn that was happening. Um, and just to give a context for that, um, the people that received offers went on this waiting list between October 15th of 2012 to January 8th of 2013. So we're talking nine to 10 years of wait. Um, you know, it's, it's such a thing that when parents have a child, when a child is born with an intellectual developmental disability, um, I think as soon as parents learn about the potential of services, we have people putting, um, you know, applying for um, services on the waiver many, many years before those services might even be needed because wanting to make sure they, they kind of reserve that place in mind. So again, it just speaks to the magnitude of the um, importance of looking at options. Um, um, I would say that in the context of that, we do serve um, people who meet certain crisis criteria are added to the waiver. Um, those, those primarily have to do with um, issues of kind of abuse or neglect. Um, if through um, child or adult protective services or law enforcement, um, there's an assessment that the person needs protection from abuse or neglect, um, or if there's serious risk of harm to themselves or others, we can, we do bring a additional folks onto the waiver. And, then, and those numbers have ranged anywhere from maybe a low of 130 to a high of just over 200 as we look each year over the last few years. But again, they're coming on under the crisis exception, which that then also limits the number of others who come off the waiting list. Um, so, and there's a lot of contributing factors to the waiting list. I know when we have these conversations, um, you know, particularly in, in recent, in the last two or three years, you know, it's balancing the awareness that um, <clears throat> even if one could fund the amount of money it would cost to clear the waiting list, we simply don't have the workforce to do that um, with some of the challenges that are out there with the workforce, particularly the direct care workforce. And so the legislature in recent years has really prioritized its focus on how do we develop and retain this workforce so we can have a robust system to provide those supports and services. So it's not really an either or, but those workforce issues have have really risen to the top to say, if we don't address those issues, um, it doesn't matter how much money you put into a waiver um, because you won't have people to actually deliver those services on a regular basis. Um, couple other things just related to the waiting list I'll mention on the IDD waiver. Um, I think when I was doing the KDADS overview, I mentioned that um, through one of the federal um, pots of relief dollars to do with the enhanced matching Medicaid dollars um, related to um, HCBS services, um, the state states are able to um, invest some of the state savings from those enhanced Medicaid rates in particular projects. We've had to go through you know, a long process to get approval from the, the federal government. One of those pieces um, that we're investing in is a study of the IDD waiver wait list. Um, to really get a better understanding of this, we've contracted with the KU Center on Developmental Disabilities as the contractor for the study. Um, and um, that's really gonna give us, I think, a good picture of what are the, the current and future service needs of those 4,000 and some individuals who were on the wait list. Um, as well as um, maybe better methodologies to identify issues of crisis. Um, and, then, and then just ideas and options about how we build system capacity to reduce those waiting lists. And it's a long project, but we'll be receiving information along the way that will be helpful and particularly helpful um, in the conversations about um, a possible community support waiver. 
So, so that's the IDD waiver, our biggest waiver, um, and the most people on that waiver, the most costly, also the longest wait list. And again, because if you think about a person with an intellectual and developmental disability, they're not go they're going to come on the waiver. They're going to, in most instances, stay on that waiver for many, many years or decades. So that's different than the for elderly waiver. It's different than the autism waiver where they may age out. It's different than the brain injury waiver where I'll talk about that's really more of a rehabilitation waiver. So again, it's, it's a circumstance where um, you don't have a lot of churn. Um, so you're not able to just make progress on the waiting list because of people coming and going off that list. All right, the physical disability waiver program was established in 1997. It serves individuals aged 16 to 65 years old. Um, again, individuals have to have been determined disabled by the Social Security Administration, and they have to meet the criteria for placement in a nursing facility. Um, so they have, to qual they have to have that level of disability. Similar kinds of services, um, in, if you think of personal assistive services, and when I think about this waiver, I think about those um, working age persons with physical disabilities who need certain kinds of supports and services for them to be able to you know, get out of bed in the morning. Um, they need help to be able to um, get ready for work, um, those sorts of things. Many individuals on the physical disability waiver are working to some extent. Um, and so again, um, think about the for elderly waiver but in terms of services, but think about a younger population. Those waivers were actually combined at one point in history in Kansas, and they were separated out in, in um, 1997 um, to be able to be a little bit more unique to the different issues of maybe younger, younger persons with disabilities uh, separate from the for elderly. Um, so again, um, <clears throat> That waiver, again, in place since 1997. Um, so about 6,000 people served. Um, this is also a program where um, we do have a wait list. About 2,000 people are on the wait list. Um, we do, though, um, we don't have a 10-year wait. We do have a wait of about two years um, to get on the waiver for people with physical disabilities. Um, we, uh, in this waiver, because we do have more um, coming and going than we do on the IDD waiver, um, we're, a, we're able to offer um, 300 individual services in our, in our latest offer of, of waiver slots um, starting next week. So you'll see about 300 be offered services um, during, this, during this fiscal year. And that's, that's just within the existing budget. Um, Again, same, same issues on, in terms of factors, you know, the obviously having available funding to support waiting lists, um, obviously um, issues of workforce are common across all these waivers. I, I've also given you a chart, um, same thing as on the IDD side on page 20, um, that kind of shows a bit of the PD waiting list. And again, you can see that there was a period of time where it was down to zero in the, in the, mid first decade of the 2000s. And then it's been up and down a bit. Um, when it went down, uh, again, quite a bit um, in, you know, like go, going down to that low again in 2016, those are really targeted resources where the legislature would say in its budget, um, you know, fund, you know, 300 additional slots on the PD waiver, those sorts of things. So again, it's not uncommon for you to see in budget requests, requests from us as an agency um, for funding to reduce waiting lists um, or funding to increase rates. I mean, those are really the, the, the two pieces that, that can go hand in hand. Um, the, the next waiver I wanted to talk about, I think I'm just down to the last three waivers, um, is the Serious Emotional Disturbance Waiver. This is a waiver that was established in 1987. It serves, um, it serves children um, who have um, serious mental health issues um, that, who, ha who are, have what we would call serious emotional disturbance. And what that means is they've got a mental health condition that substantially disrupts their ability to function academically, emotionally, socially. The waiver serves um, kiddos aged 4 to 18. Um, they have to be at risk of inpatient psychiatric treatment to receive these services on the waiver. They have to meet Medicaid eligibility. They have to go through a 
a, spe a specialized assessment, the child and adolescent functional assessment um, for eligibility. Um, Community mental health centers are the front door for this waiver, just like CDDOs are for the IDD waiver. Um, they conduct the, um, the CAPAS assessment to determine the functional eligibility. Um, and they're also the entity that directly provides the services to these families. Um, that could be parent support, could be individual and group therapy. Um, for the older kiddos, could be some independent living skills. Um, we, we also have the ability for some short-term respite for um, families families um, and for their caregivers um, and uh, through attendant care and some options like that. Um, um, this waiver also has um, what we call a wraparound facilitator who works with families and, and providers to help set the treatment goals and decide what those children and families need. Um, the SED waiver also does not have a wait list for services. Um, Couple more. Um, the technology assisted waiver um, was established in 1995. Um, this waiver serves individuals from birth through 21. And these are children who are born with a medical condition that makes them dependent upon technology to survive or to otherwise be medically fragile. For example, um, they might be dependent upon a ventilator. Um, they're, in many cases, they're probably reliant on a G-tube um, in terms of, of, of feeding. Um, and they require significant nursing support. Um, you know, the predecessor for this waiver nationally, um, actually, and, and, and we had an, an option in Kansas too. This is, this is more robust than that. But this, this actually, the idea of this actually goes back to 1980 and President Reagan when there was a little girl named Katie Beckett who had lived her life growing up in a hospital room um, because she could not get the Medicaid services she needed at home. She was reliant on a ventilator 24-7. She was reliant on a feeding tube and her parents challenged that and at one point they um, they actually went directly uh, at, in some setting to the president and he made a single case exception for Katie Beckett that then became known as the Katie Beckett waiver um, and then ultimately over the years um, um, states began submitting waivers for this option so these are really really medically fragile kids and um, those of you on the committee know that you know the reliance here is really on some of that specialized nursing care that that's also an area where um, this committee and the legislature in recent years has, has invested some resources around the rates for that, those specialized nursing care. Um, so so this, is, this, is, this is really intense because you, know, you really need, this isn't about direct care workers coming in and helping you get dressed. This is about specialized nurses who understand um, what the service needs of that child are. They understand how to do very specialized things um, around that child and really allowing that, that that child to remain in his or her home. So um, again, also a waiver that we do not have a waiting list for. Um, um, on page 24, a little bit more about just the, the eligibility for it, but I think I, I really talked about that already. You really have to be reliant on certain medical technologies for your survival. You have to have certain um, acuity level of care for the kinds of nursing that you need, things like that. Um, there's a lot of points for, of entry for this. A lot of times it comes directly from the children's hospital that that child um, is in or residing in. Oh. All right, last waiver um, to talk about in terms of the seven waivers is the traumatic, what started as a traumatic brain injury waiver, which is now the brain injury waiver program. Originally established in 1986, um, and again at that point it was a waiver for individuals with traumatic brain injury. Um, that's, you know, the kind of brain injury that happens by an external force. You use the example, right, of a motorcycle crash. It could be other things that, uh, but again, a, a traumatic hit to the head. Could be a sports accident. Could be a lot of things. Falling off a ladder. Could be a, a lot of things like that. Um, um, it was expanded in 2019 through legislative direction. 
um, to include acquired brain injury. Um, again, strokes, um, any sort, anything that's led to like an oxygen deprivation. Sometimes that might be an infection, it could be a disease, um, could be maybe a near drowning, anything that might lead to that um, lack of oxygen to the brain. Um, and then at the same time, um, we were also directed to expand that to children. Prior to um, the 2019 expansion, the traumatic brain injury waiver um, only served um, folks 16 and over. Um, um, again, the, the kind of institutional equivalent here is what we think, what we call brain injury rehabilitation facilities, and we call them TBRFs here. Um, and that's really the intensive facility where someone really first goes after they have a traumatic brain injury. Um, and then under the waiver, they can then continue um, their rehabilitation in the community. So what this waiver provides on page 26 um, are the services um, that you really need for rehabilitation. The thing I want to just really make clear about the brain injury waiver is that this is not intended to be a long-term or lifelong, lifelong service. This is intended to be a rehabilitation waiver. You know, think about you know, your cells, maybe not brain injury, but, you know, people have an injury, you get physical therapy, you know, your insurance is only going to pay for that while you're progressing, while you're still you know, that rehabilitation is still active, you're still making progress. So BI is really designed to be a rehabilitative program that provides those therapies and supports that allow the individual to continue to improve to the best level that they're going to improve to and to rely less and less on supports as that level of independence increases. Um, and then, so um, again, that, that kind of fits into the eligibility for the waiver. I mean, so in addition to having that injury, in addition to meeting the criteria for the rehabilitation hospital placement, you have to have active rehabilitation needs. Um, you also have to be determined disabled or have a pending determination by the Social Security Administration. Um, but my point here is you kind of have to be able to improve to get on or stay on the waiver. The majority of the people on the BI waiver um, come, and go, come off the waiver between years two and three. Um, some of those don't move to any other service based on their level of improvement. There, may, there are some individuals that, um, based on their functioning after that rehabilitation, may still need services. So, for example, there are some who might transition to the physical disability waiver if they continue to need those kinds of, those kinds of supports and services for their activities of daily living. But when, you, when on page 28, when we talk about the services, what might be a little bit different here is in addition to those personal care services, you have those active rehabilitation services, you know, the physical therapy, the speech therapy, the occupational therapy, those things we, we all are really aware of as we think about, you know, rehabbing from any injury or any event that happens in a person, person's life that leads to a loss of functioning. Um, so again, that's the, that's the BI waiver. Um, it also um, does not have a waiting list at this point. So we have two, two of the waivers that have formal waiting lists. Um, I, I wanted to just close by um, just uh, talking about um, some of the, re the recommendations that were made last year through the legislative process, um, and primarily really through this, com through this committee as a starting point. Um, um, that's on page 29. These were investments in rate enhancements across the waivers. Um, the first was a standardization of personal care service rates. That was in the governor's recommendation last year and endorsed by the committee. Um, and then um, further, the legislature um, added the additional funding for nursing rate increases in both the developmental disability waiver and in the technology assistance waiver, as we talked about earlier. Um, and also rate increases for both the for elderly waiver and then a 25% rate increase for the IDD waiver. So this legislature invested about $170 million um, in the fiscal year 23 budget um, to, um, to impact um, the rates paid under these services. Um, you'll see a few additional requests from us in, in this year's budget. Um, and we've listed, I'm not going to go through those because you'll talk about those in the budget. But, um, but a couple of other um, rate adjustments for for some things um, like targeted case management and also some rate increases related to those brain injury rehab facilities. So 
Again, we'll talk more about those in the budget. Um, so that's an overview. I didn't really talk about the community support waiver today. I know your staff is going to talk about that. I know we mentioned that the other day, but the thing I would say about that is, I mean, as you think about the IDD waiver, I mean, the conversation, um, you know, this summer about options were, is there, are there some different ways to think about how to address that and to perhaps to think about perhaps a less robust service alternative that could meet uh, many of the needs of some individuals that are on the wait list. So you'll hear more about that and I know this committee will probably talk more about that but happy to answer any questions Mr. Chairman. Very good committee thank you Casey or Representative. <laughs> Sorry. Thank, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is on slide number four. Okay. Uh, when you talked about uh, services what type of services duration amount and scope duration um, is there a time limit per se um, when you talk about duration in terms of how it's act the waivers are, are uh, are, are determined when I say duration is it like for when the, the department determines that is it like for a year uh, is there a time limit on there uh, by chance yeah I mean this doesn't refer exactly to that I mean um, what, what you're talking about I mean on the the brain injury waiver you do have to show progress right you have to show that rehabilitation but this might talk about like on the service how long is the service is it a 15 minute service is it a 30 minute service yeah um, but I think to your point um, yours is probably most re that your question is probably most relevant on the brain injury waiver but certainly individuals on, on the waivers need to continue to meet the the eligibility criteria. I mean, if for some reason a person did not need those supports anymore, um, they wouldn't remain on. But on most of the waivers, um, the individuals aren't likely to. I mean, a person with an IDD is not likely to not have an, not have a developmental disability. So again, um, so yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Clifford. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Howard, uh, you mentioned the uh, offer rounds are. are starting, uh, and I'm sure you've done others before, but like on the IDD, what are you finding when someone's waited 10 years? Are, are they alive or, you know, what, are they, they've grown up and grown out of the need? I mean, what, what's being discovered out there and, and how long do they have to respond because there's someone else waiting behind them? Thank you. Sure. Um, I mean, let me speak generally, and then if I might, I, I have with me today Michelle Hayden, who is our director of all of our HCBS waivers. I might have her speak a little bit more specifically to your question. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, it's a mixed bag in the sense that um, in some cases, um, individuals who would come up to the top of the list might be instances where, where families had their child on the list, and it's coming up at the time that they need those supports. But in many cases, you know, time has gone by. Um, some service needs might have changed. Um, we do give them a period of time to respond and then we move further on the list. But I'll let Michelle talk a little bit more about how that process works if she might. Okay. Hi, Hi I'm Michelle Hayden. I'm the HCBS director for KDADS. Um, when we do the offer rounds, that's when we have some available slots for the waivers. Um, and when, uh, when they, we send out a notice through the CDDOs, um, notifying them as well of who were, were um, giving the offer rounds and we're, it's first come, first serve. So that's where we get that. Um, and then we give them a certain amount of time to respond. We also ask the CDDOs and the MCOs to help us locate these people. Um, usually we, we have a, a cleanup list. We have the waiting list, which we um, go through every six months, I believe, to update it and make sure people are still where they're supposed to be. Um, and the CDDO helps us with that in their local area. And because it's IDD, they usually do not grow out of, I think you asked if they grow out of their, their need for that, usually not. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many further questions? I just have a few items for the committee, just that I'm Secretary, you did a good job. You, you know, my, uh, this is kind of a passion for me, and so I, I've got a couple of things just just for your own information, one of the reasons why our wait list is growing like this is because they're living longer. Folks are in, the, in the ID community are living longer, and it's just that simple. Um, 
one thing you want to, might want to remember is just for your own information, 68% of this wait list is receiving Medicaid. So they're receiving not the services that they need, but they're, all, but they're receiving their health care. So that's very important to remember. And the others may be private pay or their parents or something like that. So um, we did, and, and Madam Secretary talked about it, a $5 million study to study the wait list. Quite frankly, anybody that tells you they know who is on the wait list right now is guessing. And, I mean, we and what services you are, and I. It took me a while to figure that out, but that's the truth. And and uh, so just remember that. But I'll tell you a little story about how and Representative Ballard w was around when when this started. But so I chair started chairing this committee, and everybody was always talking about the wait list. I mean, I heard it. Everybody, you know, but it's a big deal, and so. It was at that point in time. It was twenty million dollars a year to uh, take the wait list, and so we would take it twenty million, you know. And so it was about one hundred and twenty million dollars we could have entered it. And so I had that all figured out, and I thought I was just cruising along pretty good. And uh, you know, there's a uh, hesitancy for people to tell legislatures that they're full of you know what. Okay, so. Uh, and so I'm telling them about this, you know, my plan, you know, and everything. And finally, a group of, of providers and stuff got together and they said, um, and, and I think they drew straws and whoever lost was the one that had to tell me that I was full of it because they could not take a, a one person off of that wait list because there was no capacity. We did, you know, I didn't know. Nobody had said anything to me. I had no idea what they were even talking about. I said, well, they said, well, you don't get it. We don't have the capacity to take one person, you know, they're barely able to take the 200 that we do, you know, because we don't have the staff. We heard testimony in this committee that their, their um, turnover rates were 50% or more. You know, our rates weren't up there. So it was uh, back... Plan B, which was build capacity. That's what this committee has done for the first time. <clears throat> the first rate increase was like 7%, and we thought that would fix everything. Along came COVID and just blew us completely out of the water. I mean, our providers shut down, their staff, I mean, just it just devastated them. So last year, we implemented a 25% increase. Massive. I appreciate the rest of the legislatures in this committee for, for doing that, but it had to happen. We, or we were, what were we going to do with, with these folks? So this year it's in the budget again at 25%. It's a, it's a huge investment, and I appreciate the legislature stepping up for that, but it really had to happen. So we had to get our ducks in a row so we had the capacity to do this. Flash forward to plan... A or B or whatever is the community support waiver, which is, we'll talk about that later. So anyway, I just wanted to give you a little bit of heads up of, of this journey we're on and how uh, it's going. So anyway, with that, Dayton, are you ready? All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson and members of the committee. My name is Dayton Lemonia, and I'm a fiscal analyst with Kansas Legislative Research Department, uh, KLRD, and I'm assigned to the KDATS budget. Uh, this afternoon, I'll be presenting the recommendations of the this past interim's Special Committee on IDD Waiver Modernization. Uh, you should have that report in front of you, and we'll go ahead and turn the page. You should see a gray box. That box contains the interim committee's recommendations. The special committee generally agreed that the state should pursue a community supports waiver. In addition, the committee recommended the following items. <clears throat> KDAD should provide a fiscal impact statement for each service discussed by the committee for possible inclusion in the waiver. A $20,000 annual individual cap should be placed on the waiver. The executive branch should transition the managed care system from an 1115 waiver to a 1915B waiver. 
KDOT should provide an estimate on the number of individuals who are likely to request self-determination. And uh, this is quite a lengthy one. <laughs> KDHE and KDADS should study the strengths-based assessments, such as the CIS or the MIFI, as alternatives to the current deficit-based basis assessment tool. Uh, next, the community support waiver should include individual budget authority for all services. And KDHE and KDADS should um, identify a process to prevent children from being removed from the autism waivers proposed recipient list without notification. And I'm happy to stand for any questions you might have. Very good. Committee, questions? Well, I'm not letting him off that easy. Anyway, no, Nathan worked very hard. Uh, you look on this list, Representative Clifford was on, Representative Rees, Representative Ballard, and myself, and Senators. And um, we did, a, I think, a pretty good job of discovering what we need to address. You know, this waiver, it's a waiver light. But we still don't have the fiscal note on that. I'm guessing, my guess is around $40 million. But we apply for that waiver, so no funding will be needed for two years. Because we're, our waiver, our current waiver, in 2024, and so there's no need to apply for another waiver until this one expires. But this one will be renewed because it's all-encompassing 13 service waiver, and the one that we're looking at is seven services. We had a robust meeting, uh, providers, and clients, consumers. I mean, we heard the gamut of of the needs, so I'm very uh, happy about this. A lot of work went into it, and, but I think it gives us a path forward to uh, remove, I believe, probably, my guess is half the people uh, will, will be removed off the wait list by this. And then they'll also, I think in some of our provisions, they weren't going to be, if they couldn't, uh, if the community support waiver did not fit them, then they held, there was a slot held for them to go back onto the big waiver, so to speak, okay, if, if it didn't fit. So it wasn't like we were displacing anybody. So anyway, Representative Clifford. Chairman, I, I do have a, a question for maybe you. Uh, I was a little confused in the interim committee about the uh, MIFI because it sounded like it was intellectual property, University of Kansas, but don't we own the University of Kansas? And shouldn't they provide it? Because it was some hang up in the community that it would cost too much to, to migrate to the MIFI. Did, did you ever understand that or maybe Nathan? I remember the discussion and there was a variety of reasons that someone way smarter than me will have to tell you why we used we didn't go with MIFI versus, um, what was that other one? Yes. 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 Uh, so, yeah. We, I think we were going to study that. Is that correct, Dayton? What, was, what were we going to do on that? It was a recommendation, wasn't it? Yes, the recommendation was to study using another type of scale, whether it be the CIS or the MIFI. Um, and I'm might let the agency speak specifically to this, but my understanding is that they are working to study a new assessment tool. Uh, but yes, that was the recommendation was to study, but it was not decided which, yes. Best. There were arguments on both sides, as you remember. Um, you know, as you guys remember, we, you know, some folks were for it, some folks were against it. it it's a very comprehensive test <laughs> from what I understand. Representative Reason and I think what impacted me the most about listening to, to um, the individuals who are under the waiver and have to be assessed and how intrusive and um, that some of the questions were. And so there, there weren't very strengths-based uh, kind of questions or assessments. And, uh, and some of the younger, younger uh, folks were quite embarrassed by it and, and kind of, you know, felt pretty traumatic uh, after some of the 
the questions that were asked. So I, I was really, um, really happy that our committee took the time to listen to those who are impacted the most by the waivers and, and, and by uh, the use of those assessments. And uh, um, I, I, I like the conclusion that we've come to. There's more studying to be done with those, the, the uh, assessments, but I think it's, it's worth uh, the wait uh, to get it right. Thank you for that. Representative Donahoe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, <clears throat> as you explained earlier, the problem with getting people off the list was because of the infrastructure. We don't have the infrastructure in place, correct? So how does uh, going to the community situation allow us now to take X amount of people off? Where, where is the infrastructure? How is that coming about to accommodate those people? Well, and my, and the providers will be heard during the budget to discuss that. So they'll be able to tell you in their own words how much that has helped them raise their pay. And many of you, um, maybe not on the Appropriations Committee, but literally I was very insistent we are going, we, we, re we <clears throat> requested a survey to make sure what they did with the money. I mean, we're, we want to make sure that that goes where we intended it to go. I think they're around 14 or $15 an hour now, the providers are. So they, they have stabilized their work, workforce from all the providers that I've talked to. And so now they're able to build from there. And so with that, building that capacity and having the money to continue to pay those folks at a competitive rate with compared to McDonald's or any of that kind of stuff, they should be able to continue to build their workforce and well, then we can take care of more people. I, I, I guess just my, just myself and my thinking, was considering infrastructure to be, not people, but buildings or whatever to accommodate these people. What you're terming uh, indicating as infrastructure is the salaries paid to people. Is that correct? Correct. It wasn't that we lacked the buildings to put them in. It was a lack that we had the people. These are very labor-intensive folks, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, 24 hours a day. And so it was, the, it was the help was really what we were getting at. And we heard tons of discussion, you know, from the providers about, about that. So it wasn't really that they didn't have a building big enough to put it in. It was just that they didn't have staff to staff it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Clifford. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I might comment to uh, the representative from Shawnee, um, the big waiver is 13 services. So you know, people may need three. So, and you're, you see a $20,000 cap, which may be a little bit low, but I did the math. The IDD is uh, 68,000 for somebody on the full big waiver 13 services. So we're looking at spreading the money further and reducing the number of services that any particular individual needs giving services to other people. So I think the math would work. Well, Thank like you. you said, we probably, you know, ideally we can serve three people off the waiver if, they're, if they fit the criteria for the waiver light for every one that we serve with the full load of 13 services and all that. So that's kind of the whole thinking about how this went to where we got to. You know, this is a fascinating study for so many reasons. Um, I think you've heard a lot, but it was, this was one I think, I've been on several studies where we really heard from a diverse population of people. And they're telling you what it's like. Um, one of the things that struck me is a large majority of people with IDD lives with their families. And that's who's really taking care of them. And those are the ones that, as they age and get to a point that maybe they can no longer do this, they have a lot of anxiety about who will be taking care of my loved one that we have spent years and years doing. And as I said before last week, save the state millions of dollars. So then 
they get to a point where maybe they begin to have ailments and they need help and how does that happen? And then if the wait list is so long, then they don't get any kind of comfort whatsoever. So for us to really listen to what they were saying from either the embarrassing questions that the basis was asking, and it's, it, was, it was just, you know, not information they really had to have, or maybe you could have asked it another way if it was that important. But it was, I wish I could think of all of the stakeholders at the table. We had almost everybody who would want to have a say-so in the matter. Instead of all of a sudden, as legislators, we will make this decision and we have it. Well, ultimately, yes, we get to make it because we get to vote on it and um, try to fund it. But from the people that are rec working directly with the people themselves are telling us what the situation is like. And that's different than hearsay. And this gave us a different perspective. And you could see why we have to make changes. And that wait list, I think um, Secretary Howard mentioned, once these people are on it, they don't get off. The rehabilitative ones, yes, if you get it early enough, they can get off and become productive and, and work. The new people can move. But once these are on, they stay on. But most people think they're not on the list, so they're not getting any services. And you heard our vice chair say, uh-uh, they are getting services. They're just not getting everything they need. But still, when you hear 10 years, it's like, oh, my goodness. But the way this was structured and how we looked at it and how much funding and what we can do to adjust some things is probably the most hopeful thing I have seen since I've been here of decreasing that waiting list. So it takes a long time, and I know it's complicated, and people are really sad, but when they, those people that are hearing about this, they are very hopeful that the, their worries may be taken care of. So it was a wonderful three days. Um, long days, <laughs> and, and, but very productive days. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nathan, I, I don't know. You can call on somebody in the audience from the agency if you don't want to answer this or can't. It seems like on the assessment, we, we have an annual assessment, Secretary Howard, and, and that was a little bit of a rub that they would come back with the whole basis tool, uh, we, and, and the young person may run out of the room and being frightened by the questions. And we talked about assessment light in that meeting. I don't know if that can be a piece of this because maybe the feds won't let us do that. Um, but did, didn't you get that sense, uh, Representative Ruiz, that you know, it's, uh, often it was not the initial, that's bad enough, but they had to come back every year and ask these people the same terrible questions. And, but are the feds making us do it or can we go assessment light Thank you. I, I can't go too deep without phoning a friend too, but um, we do have to do an assessment every year. The federal government does not mandate the assessment. Um, since the interim, we have um, begun, we have sort of, um, sort of restarted some of those MIFI groups. Um, so continued work has happened related to the MIFI assessment that so much work had already gone into, but it had kind of gotten sidetracked. Um, and um, we're looking to do some um, field testing of that um, shortly as well. So, um, so I mean, we recognize the issues and concerns related to basis. Um, you know, you, you heard much of that this summer. I'm not an expert on exactly what MIFI has within it. I haven't, you make me want to go and ask for the questions so I can um, look at those and say we might have this alternative. But to answer your question, we, we have moved, um, work groups have started meeting again um, and are looking to do some field testing on that, on that assessment to, to see if that's going to meet the needs that we have. Thank you, Secretary Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and, and on that, um, we had some really subject experts on our committee that probably knew more than 
Uh, I mean, we did have some experts on that committee that knew all of this stuff forwards, backwards. One of the gal worked for uh, CMS and was so familiar with everything that we were dealing with. And uh, we had seven states testify. We're, we're not, it's not like we're reinventing the wheel here. Other states, there are seven states that have been very successful with a waiver like. Actually, some states have five or six different waivers. That mm -hmm. Some of them could be as little as $50 a month, you know, and then they step them up according to that. So it was a very, and staff, uh, KRD, I just can't tell you how well they did in putting this all together, and we just show up for this meeting, and, and uh, everything was there. So anyway, further questions, committee? Okay, seeing none. Um, boy, it pains me to let you guys out of here before five o'clock, but uh, I guess. <laughs>